a moment to pray. Father, we want to thank you that you are amongst us. We want to thank you for your Holy Spirit. And we pray, Lord, that you would open our ears and open our eyes to your message of love. For we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. We're going to sing. Stand and sing. Come, let us worship the King of Kings. Come, let us worship the King of kings, the creator of all things. Let your soul arise to him. Come and bless the Lord our King. Lord, my heart and voice I raise, to praise your wondrous ways and with confidence i come to approach your heavenly throne come and fill this place with your glory come and captivate our gaze come and fill us with your fire that the world might know your name For you are God And you're worthy to be praised And you are good For your love will never end The greater I am You are faithful in all of your ways For you are God And you're worthy to be praised you are good For your love will never end The greater I am you are faithful in all of your ways. All of your ways. We want to thank you that you are amongst us now. We want to thank you that you are worthy of our praise and our adoration. The splendor of the King, the one we worship. Come, let us worship him now. The splendor of the King Clothed in majesty Let all the earth rejoice Let all the earth rejoice He wraps himself in light And darkness tries to hide And trembles at his voice And trembles at his voice how great is our God, sing with me how great is our God, and all will say how great, how great is our God. And age to age he stands, and age to age he stands, the time is in his hands, beginning and the end. Beginning and the end, the Godhead three in one, Father, Spirit, Son, the Lion and the Lamb, the Lion and the Lamb. How great is our God, sing with me, how great is our God, oh, we'll see how great. Great is our God. He's the name above all names, worthy of all praise. My heart will sing how great is our God. Name above all names. He's the name above all names. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, sing with me. How great is our God, and all will see how great, how great is our God.
let's just hear your voices only. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. And all will see how great, how great is our God. One more time to finish. How great is our God. Sing with me. How great is our God. Oh, we'll see how great, how great is our God. Amen. Thank you for your greatness today and your goodness to us. We want to thank you as your people. We can sing your praises. Amen. Amen. Friends, be seated. Where's Chloe Craven? So... If it never happened, what happened? So I've got some pictures here, and see if you know anything about them. And if they didn't happen, what would have, what would have happened? So the next one. Anybody know where this is? And what these two pictures have got anything to do with? Any guesses? Know where it is? What it might be? Well, well it, it's not actually a church. It looks like a church, but this is actually the Vienna School of Fine Art. And there's a no entry sign. Any ringing any bells for anybody? Oh, no one knows. And that's because I've talked to no about this. Anybody else know? Go on. It is. So, did you know that Hitler actually applied to go to the Vienna School of Fine Art twice? and got turned away. He wasn't allowed in. And I wonder if that wouldn't have happened, if maybe Hitler would have got into that fine school of fine arts, what the difference would have been? What would have happened? Maybe, we don't know, but maybe there wouldn't have been, next slide, so maybe there wouldn't have been World War II. Maybe Caroline and Lee wouldn't be going on reenactments at weekends. The whole course of history could have changed if that hadn't happened. Okay, let's think about the next one if it hadn't happened. Now, I'll tell you the name of this man. This is David Blair. And there's some binoculars and a key. Anybody know anything about this? No, well, you can't keep answering. <laughs> Go on, Audrey. Pardon? Oh, it is well done. This is a commander, second officer, David Blair. And he should have been working on the Titanic. And just before it was about to set sail, a more experienced officer came on board and he had to quickly leave the ship. I think he would have been a little bit grumpy. It was the Titanic's maiden voyage. But what happened was, when he left, he took something with him by accident in his pocket. And he took a key. And the key was for the cupboard in the, in the um, ship's... Yeah whatever it's called, crow's nest. Um, and it was the key for the cupboard where the binoculars were kept. And after one of the survivors named Fred Fleet, who survived the sinking of the Titanic, said later uh, in an official inquiry, if they had had binoculars, they would have been able to see the iceberg sooner. And in his opinion, enough time to get out of the way. So if this guy, oh, there we go, and because of that, the Titanic sank. If that hadn't happened, if he hadn't been replaced by another officer, if he'd not took that key in his pocket, how different things might have been. Something to think about. Our next one. Whoa. This building. This is the Nottingham Royal Albert Hall. And there's some choir boys there. And here, something monumental that changed the course of history in 1970 happened. Some people are laughing, so I think they might know what it is. I'm going to tell you. In 1970, at this very building, there was a choir concert. And a certain young lady... Jennifer Howard, across the auditorium saw a handsome choir boy, 
singing. And from that moment, the course of history was changed. Because after that, the rest is history. What's the next picture? Ah. And if you didn't know, that was my mum and dad. So they, mum went to a, a, a concert that dad was singing in, and she spotted him, and she actually thought to herself, oh, I'd like to marry a man like that. <laughs> she, she told us. And then she's, she bumped into him the next day at church and recognised him from singing. And I could say, the rest is history. But if that hadn't have happened, if mum hadn't gone to that concert, if dad would have had a sore throat and not been singing, crikey me, I dread to think, dread to think what could have happened. I wouldn't be here standing in front of you. Lots of things. Noah wouldn't be sat there. Uh, all our family probably wouldn't be around. That's my family there. So if things hadn't happened, how different something might be. And that we're going to be thinking about that in our service a bit later in the reading that we're doing, because I want you to think, the next picture, the empty tomb. If that hadn't happened, if there were no resurrection, if Jesus hadn't come back to life, and it says in the message, I'm going to read you what it talks about in the message, which is a bit of a modern a version of the Bible. And it says, if there were no resurrection, there's no living Christ. And face it, if there's no resurrection for Christ, everything we've told you is smoke and mirrors. So this sermon, well, sorry, John, I hope you don't need your notes. <laughs> He has risen, he has risen, he has risen, 
Jesus is alive. When the life flow from his body, seems like Jesus' mission failed, but his sacrifice accomplished victory over sin and hell. He has risen, Jesus is alive. In the grave God did not leave him, for his body to decay. Raised to life the great awakening, Satan's power. He has risen, he has risen, he has risen, Jesus is alive. If there were no resurrection, we ourselves could not be raised. But the Son of God is living. He has risen, Jesus is alive. When the Lord rides out of heaven, mighty angels at his side, they will sound the final trumpet. He has risen. 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 Jesus is alive. Yeah. Reading today from 1 Corinthians chapter 15. I'm going to read verses 12 to 19 and then 29 to 34. I'm going to read them continuously. You can find it on page 1156 or you can follow on your digital device. But if it is preached that Christ has been raised from the dead, how can some of you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? If there is no resurrection of the dead, then not even Christ has been raised. And if Christ has not been raised, our preaching is useless, and so is your faith. More than that, we are then found to be false witnesses about God, for we have testified about God that he raised Christ from the dead. But he did not raise him if, in fact, the dead are not raised. For if the dead are not raised, then Christ has not been raised either. And if Christ has not been raised... Your faith is futile. You are still in your sins. Then those also who have fallen asleep in Christ are lost. If only for this life we have hope in Christ, we are of all people most to be pitied. On to 29. 
Now, if there is no resurrection, what will those do who are baptized for the dead? If the dead are not raised at all, why are people baptized for them? And as for us, why do we endanger ourselves every hour? I face death every day. Yes, just as surely as I boast about you in Christ Jesus our Lord. If I fought wild beasts in Ephesus with no more than human hopes, what have I gained? If the dead are not raised, let us eat and drink, for tomorrow we die. Do not be misled. Bad company corrupts good character. Come back to your senses as you ought and stop sinning, for there are some who are ignorant of God. I say this to your shame. Amen. Amen. Just before John comes... Activities at the back to beat the boredom, not that it's boring. You know, we were in the, we were in the vestry early and uh, uh, we were kind of discussing the service and what we were going to do and this, that and the other. And uh, I said to, to Helen, I said, my sermon can go from 10 minutes to 50 minutes, depending on how long you go for. Um, and uh, you, and uh, where has she gone? Well, Chloe was in the back and you could see it on her face. 10 minutes, John, 10 minutes, John. Please, please, 10 minutes. So we'll, we'll have a medium. We'll have a medium. We'll think about... Um, let me get some light on this. We'll have a little think about this passage and have a think what could be said and what could be thought about. When I started training, I went to... Um, you go through all the process. And I had a good friend that I went along the process with, a guy called Jonathan Reeve. I've talked to you about him before, actually. If you uh, ever go to Chestfield Way, he takes most of the people's funerals there. He looks like Jesus. He's got great long brown hair and a beard, and he's got blue eyes. And uh, there's some, some stories and tales about him visiting folks in nursing homes and thinking, oh, oh, Jesus has come. Not yet, love, not yet. Anyway, we start, we train together for ministry. And uh, when you train for ministry, you have to do what's called a foundation training. And uh, we, we, we did all of that together. And then they shipped me off to Durham uh, for, for dummies. And he went to Birmingham where clever people went. And uh, <coughs> true. Um, but anyway, uh, when he went... One of the first things that they did was they gathered all the folks together and they, a test of what do you believe. And uh, uh, Jonathan told me about this because he was quite upset, really. And so they put him in a, in a hall and uh, asked them questions. Uh, I, I guess it would be about 20 or so folks. If you believe this, you stand at that side. And if you don't believe it, you stand at the other side. And if you're somewhere in the middle, um, stand in the middle. And so they asked him loads of different questions. I can't remember the questions they asked. Um, well, most of them. Uh, but there were two that just hold in my mind. The first one is, do you believe, the one that I remember anyway, do you believe in the virgin birth? And so off Jonathan Pops took one side, and there were another person with him. And he looked across, and uh, there was a, like strung out uh, 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 people, uh, and a, a, a good group gathered in, don't believe it. And uh, then... Uh, they said, what about the resurrection? Do you believe in the resurrection from the dead? And Jonathan said, that shot over to the other side, and there was nobody with me. There was somebody about a arm's distance away from me, but there was nobody with me. And that was it for him. It was the final straw. He said, I can't cope with this. I can't cope with this at all. These people have got no hope whatsoever. They've got no hope if they don't believe in the resurrection. And uh, he actually stopped his training. That's why he's taking funerals in Ch Chesterfield now and uh, worked for a while, left the Methodist church. Um, because what... What we both knew was, uh, if, we have, uh, if we were to have hope, if we were to have a sure footing, there's some things that you can't mess around with. There's some things that you can't say, well, maybe, or might be, or this, that, and the other. Uh, I come from Chesterfield, a lovely place Chesterfield is, I think so anyway, and people from there sometimes agree, many times they don't. Um, but the MP there was a guy called Tony Benn. And Tony Benn, uh, uh, Sir Anthony Wedgwood Benn, if those who don't know it, um, he, he changed his name, a good Labour MP. And uh, I, I listened to this interview with him. And uh, Tony Benn would say, I'm not a Christian, um, but I believe in the moral teaching of the Bible. Uh, and I believe in the, in the, uh, in the New Testament. Uh, and uh, it struck me afterwards how much this guy is. Because there are plenty of people that say, well, I believe in this bit, I believe in that bit, I believe in the other bit, I believe in this and I believe in that. But there's a place where we need to come 
as Christian folk to believe. And when Paul is, uh, is speaking to that church in Corinth, he's been asked, well, he's, he's, uh, he's writing to the church in Corinth, actually, and he's been asked some questions. Did Jesus really rise from the dead? Did he really rise from the dead? Um, and uh, another question, that prob- somebody probably died. That's probably what happened. And, uh, um, and some people say, well, will he really rise? Will he really? Is that true? And that question has passed to Paul because living in, um, in that area, uh, there's a lot of Greek thinking. And Greek thinking is, um, is that, uh, that as soon as you die, like the spirit's released. And it's all um, about nouns and th- all their thinking is confused. So we can understand why um, when, when we're talking about the resur- resur- resurrection of the dead, there's some confusion. We can understand why that thinking is. It might even be, for the Greeks, that it's, it's offensive. But what Paul says, if there's no resurrection of the dead, then Christ hasn't been resurrected. What Paul wants to say is, it's of first most importance. What is going to be happening to you when you die? We were at Christianity Explored on Thursday, weren't we, Sam and Simon? It was great. Uh, and Kerry, and I can't see somebody else. We had a great time, but that's what we were thinking. We were thinking about, what happens? What happens when you die? Well, uh, the Christian hope, sure and certain hope is, that if you, if you die and you believe in Christ, you're resurrected. New body. And uh, where's Helen gone? You know, she's at the back. Yeah, we were talking about we both was needed a new body. We, we, we were fed up with this one, a, a new one. But I want to just have us thinking, what does it mean? What, what are the outputs if the resurrection was false? Well, let me get a scripture. That's probably a good place to start. Well, the first, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, our preaching is in vain. Helen took away my dog collar and she put it in the bin and she said, done, it's, it's, no, it's no good. Our preaching's not in vain. We come here, uh, most of us, uh, every Sunday morning. Some of us come once a month and they ought to come more, but I'll tell you about that later. I'm on a, I'm on a mission Weekly, weekly, that's, that's a way to go, you know, that's, that's good for the spirit. Um, we come and we listen. Now, if we do not believe in the resurrection, why are we here? Uh, having a good time, singing some good songs, having a good cup of tea, cake, uh, and this, that, and the other. But preaching means nothing. It meant, would have meant nothing. Paul's preaching means nothing. My preaching means nothing. And every Bible-believing uh, uh, preacher, it means nothing if, they don't believe, if you don't believe in the resurrection from the dead. You're wasting your time. You may as well not come because it's the baseline, the fundamentals of where we are. The sermons are false and hopeless if there's no resurrection from the dead it might not matter jotted to you but it matters to the preacher that comes here but the more important thing if Christ had not been resurrected from the dead your hope is in vain do you see what I mean your hope where you're going if you don't believe that Christ came from the dead was raised what are you founded on because it isn't solid ground. Remember three little pigs? Um, when, it, when, it's built a, when it's built a brick, it doesn't blow over. Well, that's a solid foundation for Christians. You know, we come to this time and, and we get quite philosophical, a little bit like the Greeks 2,000 years ago, and think we're all very clever and think, oh, we can think our way around that, we can think our way around the other. And... Uh, uh, and when there's something that we don't like in Scripture, we can perhaps, I don't know, but we can perhaps start to think, well, let me reimagine this in, in a different way. Let me reinterpret it. Um, I heard that the other day. Somebody was speaking to me, and I said, well, I think you've got this wrong. I think, I think you're wrong about, it was about uh, human sexuality, actually. I said, I think you've got this wrong. And they said, well, 
We ought to reinterpret this in the light of what's happening today. We ought to reimagine what Scripture's saying. And, and friends, we can't do that. Scripture says what Scripture says. We don't reinterpret it. It interprets itself from cover to cover to cover to cover. And it opens up a wonderful story of love. It opens up a wonderful story of redemption for forgiven sins, for new life and eternity. Verse 17, it says, If Christ has not been raised, your faith is worthless and you are still in your sins. Now, sin, do you remember Separation from God. Sin, do we remember? Christ on the cross. Forgive them, for they do not know what they are doing. If we come at this part and say, I can't handle that. Well, where does it land with you for your eternity? What baggage are you carrying that you don't need to carry? What's, uh, what burdens are on your shoulder? Well, Paul says, if Christ had not been raised from the dead, you're still in your sins. You're still being held down. You're still being burdened. You've not been released. You've not been given the fullness of life that God wants you to have, that Jesus died for. This is Paul, when he speaks in Romans, he says, Christ was delivered over to death, to death because of our sins and was raised from the dead because of our justification. The resurrection of Jesus is the proof his death was sufficient to cover all. Once Paul, Paul continues, he says, If Christ is not raised from the dead, then those who have fallen asleep in Christ, that's those who have died, have perished. Friends, I take a lot of funerals, um, well, I have taken a lot of funerals over a lot of years, and one of the beautiful, most wonderful things is when you go to a, uh, someone that you know is a believer and you know that the person that they've lost was also a believer and being able to stand there and say, you will see them again. <laughs> I always think about Mr. and Mrs. Harris from Tupton Methodist Church and uh, Mrs. Harris, Mr. Harris died and Mrs. Harris said, what will you say when you get to heaven, when you see him? And she says, um, well, uh, hello, me duck. Do you want a cup of tea? Uh, that's sure and certain hope. They're there in heaven. They're going to be together again. I'm not sure they'll be making no cups of tea in heaven. I don't know. Um, but that, those words, it isn't over. You'll see them again. It isn't over. Their pain has ended. It isn't over. They're in glory. And it's, it's, uh, it's not pie in the sky. It's Christian belief and truth. If Christ hadn't risen from the dead, we're a people that need pity because we base ourselves on a lie. But our truth is that Jesus Christ went to the cross for the forgiveness of sins. Jesus Christ took the burden of sin upon his shoulder. That Jesus Christ died and was raised and on the third day he rose again. That's our belief as Christian people. Paul um, preach, Richard was preaching on the other day. For I handed to you what is of first importance, what I in turn had received, that Christ died for our sins in accordance with the Scriptures, and he was buried, and he was raised on the third day in accordance with the Scriptures. Friends, Sometimes we need to do soul searching. We need to say, God, examine me inside. What is it that we base our life on? It. What do we actually believe? And friends, I've been told that prayer corner's moved. I was going to be inviting to people prayer corner over there, but it's, oh, it's down there. I don't know why it's moved, but it's, there'll be a good reason. Um, friends, if you're not sure where you stand, I invite you to prayer corner. Let people pray with you. Let people um, stand alongside you. Because, you know, if we have unbelief, 
one of the things that we do know is God will help us in our unbelief. God wants us to be people of truth and no truth. If you, if you feel a bit embarrassed going to prayer corner, why don't you just lean over to your neighbor? He said, pray for me, because I want the fullness of God in my life. Is that something that we want? Yeah. There were a few there, were like tumbleweed, going over the, you know, those American videos. Is that what we want? We want the fullness of God in our life. In your unbelief, pray. In your unbelief, ask your neighbor to pray. Amen. Oh, to see the dawn, um, the power of the cross. Oh, of course I do. I nearly forgot about that. In fact, I did. Come on, show us your stained glass windows. Oh, to see the dawn of the darkest day. Christ on the road to Calvary. Stride by sinful men, torn and beaten then, nailed to a cross of wood. This the power of the cross. Christ became Forgiven at the cross. Oh, to see the pain written on your face, bearing the awesome weight of sin. Every bitter thought, every evil deed, crowning your blood. This the power of the cross. Christ became sin for us. Took the blame for the wrath. We stand forgiven as the cross. Now the daylight flees. Now the ground beneath quakes as his maker bows his head. Curts and torn in two, dead are raised to life, finish the victory cry. This the power of the cross, Christ became. To see my name written in the wounds, for through your suffering I am free. Death is crushed to death, life is mine to live, born through the selfless love. This the power of the cross. Son of God, slain for us. What a love, what a cost. We stand forgiven at the cross. Father, thank you for the words of truth that at the cross we are forgiven. In the resurrection we are given hope. And may hope and love and peace travel with us from now until eternity. And the blessing of God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit be with us now and forevermore. Amen. Amen.